Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Today we're looking at this uh, Grip 1640 HD engine lathe. And this is just a, a cheap commodity grade engine lathe sold by KVC Tools. And I've owned this machine for five or six years now. And you know, I just use it for tool room type work, uh, not any kind of production. And, and it's worked okay, but it has some, some nagging issues that I have never um, fully solved and it's finally gotten to the point now where uh, it needs some work so we're going to do an evaluation of this machine and see if we can identify all the problems and kind of get a, a general assessment of the condition and make a game plan as far as either repairing it or or replacing it there's your problem so the the most important you know criteria for evaluating the condition of a machine tool is can it make good parts uh, that's you know before you take any measurements before you you know make any decisions you need to you need to evaluate whether or not the machine can make good parts and in the case of this machine the answer is no at least not without a lot of struggle so this is a piece of inch and three quarter diameter 1045 sort of medium grade cold rolled steel and I set up and took a test cut on this bar at 700 RPM feeding at 14 thousandths per uh, revolution and the in feed was 80 thousandths on the diameter so 40 thousandths on a side and you can see the finish is just terrible so that should just absolutely be like, be like a glass smooth finish uh, this, this is a brand new insert and uh, this is the problem that I'm struggling with so the only way that I can get a good surface finish on this machine is either take a tiny tiny depth of cut or to polish out you know this rough surface so that that's the problem that we're we're trying to overcome with this repair now, there's a few other you know nuisance problems but the biggest issue right now is the is the poor surface finish and just for fun I went ahead and measured the diameter on one end and the other end of this test cut and now this isn't necessarily uh, a good a good test because that's a pretty deep cut 40 thou on a side so there may be some deflection in the part but <laughs> you get the idea from these numbers so but this this test cut was like not even two and a half inches long and I've got a difference uh, of four thousandths from one end to the other so we're cutting what two thousandths taper per inch uh, so that's that's no good uh, you know I would expect it to be you know one twentieth of that um, now this machine has adjust, an adjustable headstock so I could probably take care of that pretty easily I know the machines level uh, so the headstocks probably out of alignment but anyway you, you can see what I'm up against so if you want to do a you know very scientific thorough evaluation of the geometry of a machine tool this is the book that you need. This is uh, Testing Machine Tools by Georg Schlesinger. And he was a German kind of industry expert around the turn of the century. And he compiled this basically Bible of specs from different manufacturers for machine tools. And he has a lot of information about how to do testing, what tools you need, and then he has kind of a guide for each type of machine, grinder, shaper, lathe, mill, uh, that gives you a starting point for all the geometry. So this is the section here on lathes, and you can see all the different figures where he shows you know, how to set up your indicator, where to take the measurements, and then he has a corresponding table that tells you what the tolerances should be. And there's different sections for like tool room lathes, finishing lathes, turret lathes of different sizes. And then you have to kind of decide which category you're gonna fall into. And uh, you know, this is more for uh, the rebuilding side. So he doesn't have a lot of information about how to, how to check components to see if they're worn out. But he has a lot of information about checking the geometry to see if they're accurate and uh, this book is 
you can download this online from several sources. It's it's out of copyright now. Uh, I believe he's been dead since the like 1940s, so it's it's well out of copyright. And uh, yeah, you can find it as a PDF and just download it and and uh, look through it. It's it's very interesting information. It's not uh, it's not really entertaining, but that you know that you can't really find this kind of information compiled anywhere else. All right, so the first thing I want to eliminate from this uh, bad surface finish equation is the spindle bearings. And this machine has a double set of straight roller bearings. Uh, it's a, a set at the front and a set at the back. And then there's a double thrust bearing at the front. So that should be a pretty rigid setup. But we're going to test it. So what I've got is a one thou indicator on top of the chuck. A piece of wood across the ways. And then I've got this just a chunk of steel I'm going to stick underneath the chuck. And then I'm going to use my trusty pry bar and uh, see if we get any movement on the, on the indicator. Yeah, nothing. Maybe, maybe half a thou with, you know, 50 pounds of pressure on the bar. So, I don't think that's... I don't think that's a problem. Alright, roughly the same test now, but for axial movement. Yeah, nothing. Next thing to do is to check the cross slide for wear. And I'm at the I'm at the out end of the or the uh, you know start of the travel. And we're gonna check vertical movement in the dovetail first. So that's pretty good. More or less the same setup, but we're going to check this way. Yeah, basically zero. So now I'll just repeat the same test at the middle of the travel. Yeah, there's the problem. So you can see I got about eight thousandths of lift there in the middle of the travel side to side at the middle of the travel yeah about 10 so same basic test for the compound it's pretty good so next I'm going to try to check the, the bed ways and really the best way to do it is just kind of visually and it, there are some marks here uh, but there's no deep gouges and same on the flat way in the back so I would say that this set actually has pretty pretty minimal wear on the bed itself uh, these are hard ways I'm sure but then again that's Chinese hard so you know take it with a grain of salt alright so what I've done is I, I hung my indicator out off the end of the carriage and the carriage is back at an unworn portion of the bed and I've set the indicator off of an unworn portion of the bed and I'm going to run this up until I get into the worn part and then see uh, you know what reading I get on the indicator so it's kind of like using the lathe carriage as a as a repeatometer to identify a kind of a local low spot so let's see what we get All right, so it dips about three thousandths at the most worn part. So it, all things considered, that's really not that bad. So that's only about one thou on the flat way in the back. All right, it, I'm I'm testing here the the bottom of the carriage for wear so theoretically 
when they ground the ways on the bottom of the of the carriage they would have also machined the top reference surface of these dovetails so in theory they should be relatively close uh, to parallel to each other so I set up a parallel across the reference surfaces and we'll see what we get yeah so that's what we would expect it's about two thousandths higher at the back so that means that the front of the carriage has worn down and that's what we would expect because that's where the grit and chips and everything uh, is, is going to be entering the ways so the front's going to wear more alright so we have to do a little bit of extrapolation uh, the distance between the top reference surfaces here is only about five inches and the length of the total length of the carriage is about 18 inches maybe a little bit more than that so it's going to be about three and a half times as much wear in the you know front to the back side of the carriage so I think we can safely assume there's at least eight thousandths you know of, of difference in wear from one side to the other so that's pretty substantial so this is the same basic test again except this time I'm checking the flat uh, worn surface of the dovetail to the bottom of the carriage because uh, again this surface that it's ground should the plane here should be parallel to the plane of the ways on the bottom side of the carriage and uh, this one should be substantially worse yeah you can see it's about almost six thousandths so that means that this front side of the cross slide ways has worn more than the back side and again that's what we would expect because all the chips and grit and everything comes in from the front side I'm going to move on to the tailstock. I know the tailstock has some issues. Uh, I have previously shimmed, you know, underneath the body in order to, to raise the tailstock up because I know it's low. Uh, so we're going to test the we're going to test the vertical alignment of the tailstock spindle. Yeah, so it's about two thousandths high at the back or I should say two thousandths low at the front over five inches so again that's what we would expect so just like the cross slide or the carriage you know the, the front of the ways is going to wear more because that's where it encounters grit as you're moving forward so yeah it's probably worn here more in the front and it's kind of rocked its way forward all right same test but in the horizontal plane And yeah, so it's about half a thousandth out this way, which is uh, what we would want. So that's actually pretty good. And just make sure you have your tailstock barrel clamped and the body clamped when you do this test. So here I'm just testing the quill in the spindle or in the uh, tailstock body just to make sure that it's not worn or loose. Yeah, so I got about one thousandth of lift out at five inches extended so that that seems pretty good to me all right I'm just repeating the test but with the tailstock quill retracted and it's basically zero okay this is my evaluation sheet and so you really need to write this stuff down because chances are that a lot of time is going to pass between when you do your evaluation and when you actually get around to fixing the thing and if you have all this information recorded, then it'll save you some time, and you know, going back and double checking everything when you do get around to repairing it. And also, if this isn't your machine, if you're doing this, you know, for a customer, having this information recorded, you know, give them a copy. That's a good way to cover yourself because, you know, you never know. You might do all this work to repair all these things, and then it still has a poor surface finish. You know, maybe you missed something like the spindle was out of balance or, you know, a broken tooth in the gearbox or something. So you had to be able to show empirically that you made some improvement because otherwise you're going to be on the hook. Uh, so at the top here, I just made a list of mechanical problems that I know of. And uh, if you don't run the machine, you can ask the operator. But you need to be careful because from my experience, 
the guys who run the machine every day, if there's something wrong with it, they get used to it and they don't even think about it. Like they couldn't even list the things that are wrong with it because they're so used to working around it. So it's a good idea to really just go over all the systems yourself and see see what you can make of it. But on this machine, I know for sure the power feed clutch slips. It's some kind of a friction clutch. It's not a dog clutch. I've tried adjusting it several times. When I first got the machine, it wouldn't work at all. And I opened the apron, drained the oil, cleaned out the clutch, and it got better, but it, it still slips and it, it can't take a heavy cut the way it is. Uh, the second big problem, of course, is the poor surface finish that we talked about at the beginning of the video. Uh, the the four jaw chuck won't lock into the to the spindle nose correctly. This is a D16 cam lock spindle, and I've tried adjusting the cam or the uh, dogs, or whatever they're called, in that the cams the, the cams actually engage in the four jaw, and I can't make it work. I ended up actually taking three of them out and just running it with three, which is pretty sketchy. Uh, the three jaw chuck has some run out, so the master jaws. Or sorry, the top jaws probably need to be reground, and it's, maybe I should look for some new chucks because that three jaw is pretty crusty. Uh, the degree markings for the compound rest are missing. That's not a big deal, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. If you're swinging the compound around to cut an angle. You have to go get a protractor and lay it all out. And then the tailstock tool ejection doesn't work. I forgot one thing. Uh, also, this this uh, one shot lube system doesn't work, and never has worked. And from my experience like on most lathes though that doesn't work at all the only ones that really seem to work are like what you find in an American pacemaker where it has a rotary pump that's actuated anytime that the, the carriage moves those seem to work okay but these uh, these lever pump ones they don't work for crap and it has all these little uh, oil points anyway so it's not even truly a one-shot system so I was just manually oiled it and I'm super diligent about oiling the machine so whatever wear is on it you know it's just from time and probably from abuse you know before I got it so let's talk about some of the positive features about this machine so number one the biggest thing is it's already here I have it I own it it owes me nothing and I'm familiar with it so it's super convenient uh, number two it has an excellent uh, setup of for the spindle it's anywhere from 20 22 I think up to 1800 rpms on the spindle all gear drive it's a splash lube pump for the gears in there and it also lubricates the spindle bearings uh, yeah so that that part of it works pretty good it's kind of noisy but it, it has a good you know good range and then same with the threads uh, this machine actually can cut 13 threads per inch without having to change gear a lot of machines that can cut inch and metric threads can't do that uh, this one doesn't have any problem with it. I really like the way that this uh, quick change box works on this machine. Um, let's see, two and a half inch spindle bore. That's really nice to have. Seven and a half horsepower spindle motor, so it's got plenty of power. And it's an excellent size. 16 by 40. I would say that's you know 14 by 40 16 by 40 that's an that's about the handiest size you can have for a job shop so uh, another good thing about this machine it's pretty stout I would say it probably weighs like 3,000 pounds somewhere in there and it, you know it's every bit as heavy as a uh, LeBlanc or you know Cincinnati or Clausing you know it's not in anywhere near the same league as something like a Monarch uh, I really like that it has this backsplash back here uh, somebody cut a big hole in it I had to patch that at one time but it does help keep the chips from flying everywhere also uh, this machine has a foot brake and the foot brake is awesome for threading I can run right up to a shoulder slam on the foot brake reverse the spindle and it really makes it really makes it go quickly okay guys that's gonna be it I think uh, you can see you know that the machine is overall you know just just pretty well worn and I'm gonna have to make a decision whether I want to replace it or do some repairs so I'm gonna have to do something with it fairly quickly because this is the only engine lathe that I have and I really depend on the machine for the repair work it's really a pain in the butt to do repair work on the CNC lathe uh, especially like touching up threads and 
and you know boring out weird weird uh, parts for for sleeves and stuff that kind of work is still a lot better done on an engine lathe so anyway uh, yep that's a that's kind of a round trip on how to evaluate an engine lathe and hopefully uh, hopefully it's helpful for somebody thanks for watching